Morning, everyone. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we come together again grateful that uh, we have an opportunity to come together and study your word. And so we thank you for the freedoms that we experience in this nation to be able to do that when around the world so many Christians um, can only meet in secret or not at all. And uh, so we thank you for that blessing. We ask the presence of your Holy Spirit to guide us and in, uh, enlighten us as we look at your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, just a reminder, the index cards are on your table. If you uh, think of a question that uh, you uh, would like to ask, and uh, you can bring it up during the break, uh, please print. <laughs> uh, I did get a couple of them already. And let's see, one of the questions will be answered later. Um, one question asks about what about Jews who don't believe in Jesus? And you know, that is... Um, difficult topic. I, I am not sure. Uh, certainly we know the only way, there is one way to be saved, and that is through Jesus Christ. Now, whether, you know, because he died, that will extend to people who maybe don't believe in him. Um, I don't know. Uh, the Bible doesn't give us that hope, like, say, for Buddhists or Hindus. Hindus we, we just don't know. Um, the Bible is clear, though, there's only one way to be saved, and that's because Jesus died for us. Um, with Jews, it's a little bit different because they are his covenant people, and there is a verse in Romans that mentions uh, all Israel will be saved. Well, does that mean all Jews will be saved because they are part of God's family? Um, I don't know. Um, I, I support a messianic Jewish uh, mission that uses that as their motto, I guess you'd say, that the, all Israel will be saved. On the other hand, Paul says the true Israel are those people who believe in Jesus Christ and have been grafted on to uh, the original Israel. So I don't know. We, we still need to pray for people who don't know or don't believe in Jesus. We need to um, trust the Lord in his mercy to reach out to them. Uh, I frequently, I, uh, well, before I injured my knee, I took a walk every morning and passed a synagogue. And uh, when I would pass it, I always prayed that God would take away the veil that Paul speaks about that keeps them from seeing who Jesus really is. Um, so we do. We witness, we pray, and uh, we trust God. Obviously, people who flat out reject Jesus, they just don't want any part of him, as in some of the Pharisees back when Jesus ministered. Um, you know, God's not going to force himself on anyone, and obviously they would not be saved. So that doesn't exactly answer the question, but that's, I think, about as best as we can do. Uh, somebody else asked, where do we go after we first die? And that would be that paradise, that garden of God, uh, where Lazarus, re you know, rested on Abraham's bosom. Uh, it will be wonderful, but it isn't quite heaven yet. And no, we will not go to hell for three days like Jesus did. Um, that's not something that's going to happen. Uh, and then they asked the, if, um, it says, would you please explain again the terms on page three, Hades, Sheol, Gehenna, Valley of Hinnom. Um, Hades, Sheol, let me start there. Sheol was the place of the dead in the Old Testament. That is where they considered, you know, that's where you went. It was a shadowy kind of existence. Uh, David in one of the Psalms said, even if I go down to Sheol, still you are there. So God's presence would be there. Uh, and yet, another Psalm talks about how um, do the people in Sheol praise you? Assuming no. So, you know, we don't know much about it, and it doesn't seem to distinguish between good and bad. Um, 
when we get to the New Testament, then um, there is the picture of Hades and the picture of paradise. Hades being comparable to where the people who do not believe, who reject God, would go, not a good place, and believers would go to paradise. Um, Gehenna, uh, which is from in the valley of Hinnom, or kind of Hinnom, are kind of the same in that that was a literal valley in Jerusalem or outside Jerusalem. Uh, it was the garbage dump for the city. In the Old Testament, it had been a place where people sacrificed to idols and sacrificed their own children. Um, and so uh, when reforms were made in Israel, um, they desecrated that site so that it would no longer be considered holy by anyone or sacred by those who uh, practiced idolatry and that uh, those horrible acts would be stopped. And so it became the garbage dump. Uh, it was frequently fires there as they burned the trash. And that became the picture of, of hell, which uh, the Bible in the New Testament pretty much in Jesus' ministry referred to it as Gehenna. Uh, but it was based on that picture of a real life where the worm doesn't die and the fire continues. And uh, whether that's literal literal or not as a picture of hell, uh, we don't really know. Um, okay, I think that covers all but the ones we'll get to. Uh, we left off uh, last week at, uh, you mean we are not going to be equal in heaven? And that would be page eight in uh, your outline. Um, the kind of rewards, we talked about uh, getting rewards last week. The kind of rewards, uh, not real specific in the Bible. First Corinthians talks about receiving praise from God. And of course, that would be quite a reward in itself. Um, Second Timothy, Paul mentions the crown, but it's almost more in the context that all of us will receive that crown of life. Uh, Matthew and the parable of the talents is where we get more of a clue as to what the rewards would be. And if you remember that parable, Jesus talked about a king giving um, a certain amount of talents, five talents to, to one person and two talents to another and one talent to another, and then told them to... Uh, occupy to to use it until he returned and then when the king in the parable returns the man with the five talents was rewarded and told he would now be over 10 cities as i recall the parable and the one who had two he doubled it and or made five i don't remember exactly but he would be over five cities and then the man with the one talent if you remember he had buried it he didn't lose it but he didn't make anything with it he just returned it and he is the one in the parable who is condemned um, but the point being that um, the reward for their service was more service. In other words, they were faithful in what they did, and so now as the king returned, they are given even greater service to perform. And that would seem to be the picture of rewards in heaven. It's, um, hey, you, you know, you served well here on earth. Now you'll serve and have even more to do when uh, we get to heaven. And we'll talk about what that more might be um, in a little bit. Um, we also are told that we will be given new names. Uh, this is from Revelation 2. Verse 17 says, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Uh, to the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. And uh, that's an interesting passage because some people say, some biblical scholars say, well, that new name is obviously a, a name of Jesus or of God that we don't know yet. 
But that doesn't seem like it makes sense because why would it be then hidden and sort of only a kind of secret between the Lord and that person? The uh, interpretation I like a lot better is that the Lord has a nickname, a pet name for each of us uh, who love him and he loves us. And, you know, you and your family, I'm, you know, husbands and wives frequently have pet names for each other. And very often they are names that you do not share in public. Um, not that they'd be embarrassing or, you know, maybe, who knows. Uh, or you had nicknames for your children that seemed to um, just sort of say who they were and uh, who you saw them to be. And again, they might be totally embarrassed if you had called them that nickname in front of their friends or now as adult children, really embarrassed if you made that nickname known uh, to the people they know. You know, but it's that pet name. It's that endearing name. And I think that to think that the Lord has those kind of names for us and we'll be sharing them uh, as we spend eternity with him just um, shows just how close that relationship he has with you is and how much closer even he wants it to become. Um, his love for us is um, far beyond what uh, we can comprehend. And the best reward of all, of course, is intimacy with God, with Jesus. Uh, Revelation 2.28 talks about Jesus says, I am the morning star. And then at the very end of Revelation, uh, Jesus says, I am the bright morning star. He is that reward that we receive the one that's best of all at that time with him. Um, now, how it works out that uh, we are going to have different kind of rewards um, R.C. Sproul says that um, maybe there will be different ranks in heaven, that justice does not mean that uh, we are all equal. Um, Alcorn, in his book, says that uh, if God rewards according to different degrees of faithfulness, we cannot expect there to be equality of position. Uh, so in a way, I, I guess that would kind of upset some of us and yet on the other hand of course we are used to knowing that people we aren't all equal and when we had jobs uh, or maybe you still do you know there are, there was a hierarchy there too and um, and we're okay with that because that's the way life is um, there we Sproul says, uh, why wouldn't we have people even in heaven that we would look up to and admire? And, um, and that makes sense. I mean, I'm sure all of us will feel that way when we meet the Apostle Paul or Martin Luther or some of the other heroes of the church. Uh, we expect to see them in, uh, in a role that uh, we admire and thank for their service and how it's blessed us hundreds of years later. Um, we'll want to hear wise words from their lips. It's not like we're going to know everything when we get to heaven. Um, one of the authors says that it would only pride, it's only pride that would insist that no one is better than me and that uh, no one should have a higher position than I have. Uh, pride says that. Humility says, hey, I'll take the lowest place. I'll be satisfied to sweep the floors in heaven. It'll be wonderful just to be there. Um, and the fact is, there won't be any jealousy, and we will truly realize that we are all one body, part of Jesus Christ, his bride. Um, in your own body, your lungs do not envy your liver. <laughs> I mean, that would be just stupid. Um, you know, we every part of your body works together, and um, I had a pastor friend once who spoke on that, and he had a very large nose, and he says, you know, my nose has a lot of prominence, but it really isn't as important as my heart or some of the things you'll never see that are hidden. And so, you know, all of us have our part to play, and we're not going to be jealous of others who seem to have a part that's uh, more important or prominent than ours. Um, 
Kreef in his book mentions how we all have different interests, we all have different talents, um, and we all, you know, he says it's like an orchestra. If every, if every, <laughs> if in an orchestra everybody played the very same instrument, it would be um, a very dull concert. You know, it takes all the different instruments blending together that uh, really make the beauty of, um, of a concert, of a symphony. So, um, one other thing, I, and I found this uh, after I'd put together the notes, but Dallas Willard, who's, um, he's passed away now, but uh, written a lot of books uh, for Christians and um, very, he was a philosophy professor, so a lot of what he writes is not <laughs> exactly easy to understand. But in the book, The Divine Conspiracy, he says this, there is a widespread notion that just passing through death transforms human character. Like discipleship is not needed, just believe enough to make it into heaven, he means. But I have never been able to find any basis in scriptural tradition or psychological reality to think this might be so. What if death only forever fixes us as the kind of person we are at death? And of course, he goes on to say that um, if you die as a very immature believer, you are not suddenly going to be filled with all knowledge like the Apostle Paul when you enter heaven. And um, although he says we'll maybe be for permanently fixed at that state, and I don't believe that. I think that we'll always be instructing one another. We'll always be learning. We'll always be growing even in heaven. Um, another way to look at it, all of us are going to be equally loved and valued by God. I mean, that's just the way it is. He does not love one of us more than any other. Um, and in fact, there's that parable in Matthew chapter 20 where the workers, you know, some of the workers work all day, some of them work half a day, some of them work only an hour, and they're all paid the very same amount. Um, so, you know, it's, it's hard to know. We don't know. <laughs> Although, you know, in that situation, um, it was uh, the length of service doesn't matter, but whether uh, how fully we give ourselves to it may certainly make a difference. R.C. Sproul says um, there on your worksheet, everybody's cup in heaven is full, but not everybody in heaven has the same size cup. And uh, one of you uh, wrote on one of the cards uh, to please explain that comment. And the thing is, um, Jonathan Edwards, remember the old Puritan preacher, uh, sinners in the hands of an angry God. Did you have to read that when you were in school? Um, they probably don't allow that anymore because it's religion. <laughs> but anyway, um, he said that all of us, all of us will be full to overflowing with the love of God in heaven and with joy. And then, quote, but like cups with different capacities, we will experience God and all his wonders to the capacity we developed while on earth. So all of us will be filled to overflowing. We will be full of joy. We will uh, feel God's love immensely, but some of us will be able to feel that more maybe than others. And, uh, you know, if you look at worship, um, if you are a person who really, I mean, you, you count the hours till the next worship service on Sunday morning or Saturday night, and you just really get into it and you love it, uh, versus a person who, uh, Sunday morning, I guess I better get out of bed and get going, um, and has trouble with mind wandering during the service, but you're there and you join in the hymns, uh, you are worshiping. Well, in heaven, all of us are going to love the worship, but the person who really loved it here on earth will have an even greater amount of love for that uh, in heaven. But we won't you know, it's, it's, you don't know the difference. You just know that this is so fulfilling. This is wonderful. This is what I've looked for my entire life on earth, and now I'm experiencing it. So you won't have any sense that 
your experience is different from somebody else's because we all will know the fullness of that joy. Um, does that make sense? Then I don't know who asked the question to explain Sproul's comment, but um, you know, it's not like we are going to be in heaven thinking, wow, I wish I would have done a better job on earth because then I'd have, you know, more to do here in heaven. No, you'll have as much to do as, as you want to do um, because that's the way it is here. You know, you, you will have as much as God as you want of God. Um, you won't be envious of the person who has more to do Christian service-wise than you do in heaven. That's just not the way it's going to be. Because everything that we'll be doing will be fulfilling. What will the new heavens and the earth, new earth be like? And, of course, there we get to Revelation and those last couple of chapters and that really give us that picture um, but um, let me go back to 1 Corinthians here. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 says, As it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. And then he goes on to say, these are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. So, you know, we're really talking about something that <laughs> we don't know anything about. All we know is what we read in Scripture and in Revelation. And yet we also know Revelation is highly symbolic. So we don't know that, um, you know, will there literally be streets of gold or is that symbolic? Uh, gold in Scripture frequently has to do with uh, a symbol of divinity. But, um, so who knows? Um, I hope none of us are disappointed if when we get there, oh, you mean it's not gold after all? No, you know, we are going to be so amazed at everything, we're not going to think of those kind of things. Um, Sproul, in his book, writes, quote, as it is depicted in Scripture, heaven represents a radical change from what we experience in this world. And therefore, you know, we look at it as uh, analogies. Uh, well, it's like this, or it will be like that, but we don't really know. But the Bible tells us more than we think sometimes, um, just not as much as maybe we'd like to know. And so we look at what the Scripture does say and draw some conclusions from that. But keep in mind that um, it's speculation, although given we're looking at Scripture, you could say it's informed speculation. So you get to Revelation, and if you have a Bible with you, you might uh, want to turn there to those last couple of chapters. Um, Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 22. And... Um, Chapter 21 says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And so you see, you know, there's this picture of out there in space in the heavenly Jerusalem, the city descending, and uh, that obviously symbolic of God coming to dwell with us. But that is the new Jerusalem, and then he goes on to describe that in chapter 21, and we'll look at that in a little more detail in a minute. Um, Philippians tells us in chapter 3, we are already citizens of that city. Uh, it's called the bride, not because the city itself is, but because it's our residence. And um, maybe it's the capital of the new earth, 
Um, there's speculation, is it really like a suspended city up there in the sky, or is that symbolic? Uh, is it like a sun where the earth is going to revolve around that city? And who knows? Uh, those kind of things never occurred to me, but they obviously occurred to other um, scholars and students of God's word. So we don't know if it's a literal city or if it's figurative. However, however, um, Hebrews 11, where it talks about uh, the heroes of faith, um, Hebrews 11 verse 10 says that um, those people of faith were looking for a city whose builder is God. Looking for a city whose builder is God. So that would seem to indicate we are talking about a literal place. Uh, also, we are going to be given new bodies. So we will be physical beings, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Physical beings as well as spiritual, so we aren't really designed to live in a place that would be non-physical, sort of a non-place. We need something, if we're going to be physical people, we need somewhere physical to live. And so those who uh, say that heaven is merely a state of mind that we'll experience after death, um, uh, no, that clearly does not seem to be the case from the Bible. Uh, we will have a different kind of body, um, so we don't really know exactly what things will be like, uh, and yet we do have some sort of physical presence. Um, the details given about the city, especially that it gives all those measurements, which it does in chapter 21, seem to indicate an actual place. And of course, earth is a literal place, and so there's no reason to think the new earth also would not be a literal place. And of course, we will be living in the presence of God, not merely an occasional access to God's presence, but full access. Uh, there won't be a temple there, um, the end of Revelation says, because God and the Lamb, Jesus, are its temple, uh, and God's throne will be there. Now, if you look at John's description of the city in chapter 21 of Revelation, in verse 12, he talks about 12 gates with names of the 12 tribes. And then a couple verses later, verse 14, he talks about 12 foundations, and those are named after the apostles, uh, which should say, if, it, if a building has 12 foundations, obviously what it's talking is about is a place that is extremely secure and that will never, ever be shaken. Um, that it mentions the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles would seem to say that continuity between Old and New Testament, that there is really a unity there between Israel and the church. Verses 15 through 17 that uh, has the angel measuring it out uh, indicate that it is an extremely large place and it will be large enough uh, that there will be room for every single one of us. Then it talks in verses 18 through 21 about precious jewels and gold and pearls, and um, whether that's literal or not, <laughs> it would seem not, but then who am I to say? But it does point to a place of, of splendor and great beauty, a place that would inspire awe and wonder. Um, Barclay, William Barclay, who was, uh, wrote a number of commentaries some years back, um, mentions that in Eastern religions, Persian religions that were around at the time of Jesus and the apostles, that they said there's a city of the gods that's up in the sky, and it has 12 gates, and each gate is connected with part of the zodiac, you know, astrology. And each sign of the zodiac had a corresponding jewel. 
Now, whether John, in writing Revelation and seeing his vision, thought of that or not, but Barclay says, obviously, John is pointing to believers saying, forget that, forget what the Persians say, forget the Zodiac. This is the true city of God that is up there and coming down to earth. Um, Verse 25 says, the gates will never be shut because there are no enemies around anymore to keep them out, uh, that we need to keep them out, that all have access to God and his throne at any time. Uh, There's no need for sun or moon. Um, Isaiah chapter 60, see if I put a bookmark there. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 19 says, The sun will no more be your light by day, nor will the brightness of the moon shine on you. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun will never set again, and your moon will wane no more. The Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of sorrow will end. And again, that's Isaiah chapter 60, uh, verse 19 and 20. So, you know, whether that means there literally will be no sun or there's a sun, but it's just not, (laughs) it's not what really provides the light, uh, we don't know. Um, There's no, the picture of no night is that idea that, you know, night in scripture, especially as you read through the book of Gospel of John, because he goes back and forth talking about light and darkness. The idea is darkness is bad because uh, Jesus said, who walks in darkness, doesn't know where he's going, um, that he came to bring people into the light. And so darkness has that connotation of it's a place where there's crime, it's a place where you get lost. It's uh, not good. And so when the Bible says no night there, it means none of those negative things that we might associate with the nighttime. Verse, uh, then moving to chapter 22 in Revelation, the water of life uh, is there. And Jesus, of course, talks about that in the Gospel of John as well. Uh, and the tree of life, the tree of life is there. And um, Ezekiel, too, talks about, not Ezekiel chapter 2, Ezekiel also talks about uh, that tree of life in chapter 47, verse 12. He says, fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. So, of course, when John talks about that tree of life there and its harvests uh, every month producing fruit, new kinds of fruit, um, it's also uh, right there from Ezekiel. And the idea is that forever and ever we will be sustained and renewed by God's provisions for us. Uh, So maybe we'll still have needs to eat, but those needs will all be met. And of course, then in chapter 21, you have, um, of Revelation, you have all of those uh, no mores, uh, and that's a passage that uh, frequently is read at um, memorial services. Uh, Verse 4, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death. No more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Um, Revelation chapter 22 um, talks about the healing, the the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations, and that... um, raises an issue as to (laughs) what nations. Are there nations uh, that are going to still be around uh, when we have a new heaven and a new earth? Um, And that's hard to say. Uh, Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation tribe, 
people and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So when we are in heaven, will there still be that kind of recognition that um, of different nations? Uh, will, um, you know, ah, you're an Italian. <laughs> oh, you're from Africa. Um, Chinese. Um, I don't know. Um, you know, it does speak of great diversity there. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation. Um, some people say that, well, no, there will be nations, uh, but uh, all of them are healed. They're just handed over to now the king of all kings, um, and that's Jesus Christ, or to be ruled by those of uh, his followers. Um, I don't know. Certainly, God creates the different races. Uh, he obviously had a reason, and um, there is uh, a beauty to each race and each nationality, and perhaps that beauty will be preserved forever and ever. I don't know. So um, if you're proud of your Swedish, Danish, whatever heritage, uh, maybe you'll continue that heritage in heaven, although it won't be with pride. It will be to share whatever that means uh, with those of other nations and um, nationalities. I don't know, ethnicities. Um, the King of Kings, Jesus, then will reign forever and ever. And uh, in the book of Daniel, um, chapter 7, you get a picture of that as well, um, where he says, uh, verse 13, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. And you'll probably remember that Son of Man was one of Jesus' favorite titles for himself, often referred to himself as Son of Man. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and people of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And so you have that picture of different um, nations and, and peoples worshiping. Um, and it says, verse 27 of Daniel 7, Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms, all the kingdoms, all the nations, countries, under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. So as if there would be rulers who are under him. So I don't know. You know, again, we speculate. We have the words of Scripture. We know it will be wonderful. We can't tell exactly, though, what all this uh, means. Um, Jesus, when he stood before Pilate, uh, said, um, my kingdom is not of this world, uh, not from this world. He did not mean simply that it's a spiritual kingdom. You know, it, it just exists in the spirit. It doesn't have a physical presence. It's in our hearts alone. And of course, he did say, you know, the kingdom is among you. It um, is in our hearts. Um, but really, what he seems to be saying is that his kingdom is not from this world. It did not originate on earth with all of its problems. It's not contaminated by this world or by this world's values or practices. Um, but he will rule in a literal kingdom that will last forever and ever. Uh, right now, his kingdom touches our world through you through the church, through the Holy Spirit. Um, so the kingdom is near to us. It's part of us. We live under his rule, uh, not entirely. We're still waiting for that kingdom to come 100%. And so we pray, thy kingdom come. Um, 
And one day it will. One day he will rule, not just the whole earth, but um, the, the universe itself. And evil will have been vanquished, uh, but that doesn't mean it will be the end of his rule. It just means that um, his rule will no longer be contested by anyone. So here we have the new earth. Uh, somebody called it, it'll be like heaven incarnate. You know, Jesus was God incarnate, and the new earth will be heaven incarnate. And uh, what it points to is uh, restoration. We talked in our very first session uh, together about how at the fall, God's purpose for creation was... Um, lost in many respects, and that Jesus came to restore what was lost. And uh, we see that in Romans 8, chapter 20, for the creation, not just people, the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. And so we look for a new earth. And so we're going to look at that in just a moment, but why don't we just take a break, a uh, five-minute break right now, and then we'll come back together to uh, look at the creation in Genesis, a new creation in Revelation. Um, when you compare Genesis chapter 1 and Revelation, you do see uh, uh, that there is a connection there. Uh, verse 1 of Genesis, the heaven and earth are created. 21 uh, verse 1 of Revelation talks about the new heavens, new earth. Uh, chap Genesis verse 5, night was established. Revelation 22, no night there. Uh, the seas were created in verse 10 of Genesis. Uh, and then in Revelation at 21, verse 1 says, um, no more sea. <laughs> you know, I was, um, I'd been a pastor for, I don't know, some years. And uh, I was conducting a memorial service. And uh, I was reading that passage as part of the service. And that was, I swear, the first time I'd really noticed that it said no more sea. And it was like, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, I grew up in Southern California, I love ocean, <laughs> you know, how can there be no ocean in heaven uh, and on the new earth? And, um, and again, we don't know how literal uh, that passage is, but in scripture, ocean or sea uh, has a definite symbolic um, value of uh, being that which opposes God. And so Jesus stills the storm, not just stilling a storm, but showing that there is no power that's going to exert itself against his authority. Uh, in the book of Job, when God speaks to Job in the end, um, he talks about how he set limits for the sea and said, this, you can come this far and, and no farther. And so there is that sense that the sea represents chaos and sin, and so that will not be a part of um, the new heaven and the new earth. However, um, Randy Alcorn says in his book on heaven, well, there has to be large bodies of water because you have the river flowing through the holy city and rivers have to go somewhere. So there has to be an ocean or a sea or, or something. Um, so I don't know. You, who knows? Um, in Genesis, uh, verse 16, the sun is created revelation there's no need for the sun the curse is announced in chapter 3 of genesis chapter 22 of revelation there will be no more curse death comes into the picture in genesis 3 uh, revelation 21 no more death Chapter 3 of Genesis, humanity is blocked from the tree of life, and in Revelation, now it's accessible to all. And so life is restored. Creation and all of its beauty um, 
no more decay as far as nature. Uh, and all that was anticipated already in the Old Testament. Isaiah 65 verse 17 says that there will be new heavens and a new earth. Uh, some people picture it as a return to the Garden of Eden. Um, that would be unlikely because um, certainly part of human life over all these centuries has been developing the arts and science and industry, and we cannot simply go back as if none of those things ever happened and now we're just living like Adam and Eve. Um, somehow there are, because a lot of that was, that's gifts of God too. And so um, in some way that will have a part in uh, the new world as well. Um, the next uh, section there, it says the age of shalom is a very difficult sort of um, thing to fit into this whole picture because in Isaiah, uh, this is uh, chapter 11, verse 6, very well-known passage. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, the lion will eat straw like the ox, the infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And then... Um, in chapter 65 of Isaiah, um, starting with verse 17, See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at 100 will be thought a mere child. The one who fails to reach 100 will be considered accursed. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain, nor will they bear children doomed to misfortune. For they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants with them. Um, verse 25, the wolf and the lamb will feed together, the lion will eat straw like the ox, and dust will be the serpent's food. So you have this picture of a really ideal society, and um, scholars have somewhere along the line called that the age of shalom, the age of peace, and, and uh, shalom in the Old Testament was more than just peace. It had to do with well-being, uh, with life as it really should be. Now, are we looking at life the way it will be after the resurrection? Is this the new earth? Well, it doesn't seem to be because if you were listening carefully, people are giving birth and people are still dying, um, living to at least 100, but they still are dying. And of course, when we look at the new heaven and the new earth, that will not be the case. So what is going on here? Uh, obviously, the Jews understood that to mean when the Messiah comes and establishes his rule on earth, that's the way life will be. And of course, Jesus didn't do that, and, and so was obviously a disappointment to them. Now, we enter a part of uh, biblical teaching that is kind of controversial, but because nobody knows exactly what to make of it, but um, that is, uh, on your worksheet it says, where does the millennium fit in all of this? And uh, you go to um, Revelation chapter 20, 
And um, verse 1 says, And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. He sees the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil, or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. And I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. Um, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And then he says, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. Um, verse 7, when the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth and gather them for battle. In numbers, they are like the sand on the seashore. They mar marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. There they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And then the next verse talks about the great throne of God and the judgment day that comes when all the rest of the dead are raised. Um, now some... Some theologians and Bible scholars say, well, that's all symbolic. There is no real millennium, uh, no literal thousand-year reign of Christ. Others say, oh, yes, you know, the Bible says there is, so there are, it must be. Um, <laughs> I've heard it said we're living in the millennium now, which uh, really is ridiculous since <laughs> this, this is hardly a perfect kind of world or an ideal place. Um, so I don't know. Um, some people say we're living in the tribulation right now, which makes a little more sense than that. So there's a lot of disagreement with that. Um, why would there be a millennium? Why would there be a thousand-year reign of Christ on earth? And it would be a time when the church, those of us, we've already received the gift of life, um, reign with Christ, but the people on the earth are still the people who were there, um, you know, uh, before, and so they're still living and dying and giving birth. You know, it's just, it's just hard to understand, but one of the authors said that maybe, maybe there's a millennium because, because there are people who will stand before God um, who, who are to be condemned, who rejected him, and they will use as an excuse, well, if life were only easier on earth, if you had just given us breaks, if we didn't have to struggle for every single thing and, and um, have to suffer from, you know, crime and wars and disease, then, then we would have followed you, we would have loved you, we would have done, you know, obeyed your will. And so anyway, this one author said that maybe this is God's way of saying, look, a thousand years you had to live in a world like you're talking about, where there is no disease, where there is no crime, where people live a long life and they have plenty to eat. And still, at the end of that thousand years, as soon as Satan is released, they are ready to march against God and rebel against his rule. Um, you know, the Revelation says that Jesus will rule with a rod of iron. Well, where? You know, he's not going to rule in heaven, us, with a rod of iron. So it's thought that it is that thousand years. So I will just leave that with you. Um, we don't know. Uh, but it is. It seems to be a utopian time of life. It seems to fit the picture of Isaiah uh, in his age of shalom where it isn't really heaven yet, it isn't really the new earth, and yet um, it's perfect. And uh, at the end of that time, um, still, still people who do not 
love Jesus are ready to rebel against God. Um, in any event, you know, it's, it's kind of like we don't really need to worry about it. It's whatever God has planned out there, we'll be fine with it. And, um, you know, maybe we'll just all be surprised at what happens next. Um, our homes, uh, John chapter 14, that's that passage where Jesus says, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, and I'm going there to prepare a place for you. So what will those homes be like? Um, you know, I heard um, one, I don't remember who it was, but the description of um, that home would be like the typical sort of estate that would have, or not necessarily even a state, but the kind of homes in Jesus' time where, you know, a family has their house and then their son grows up and gets married and so they build onto the original house his own little room or big room, his place for his family, and so the it sort of expands. Um, and I think the, the picture closest would be almost like, you know, you go to a, a large hotel and it's got a few wings and uh, maybe it's four stories high and it surrounds an inner courtyard where that's where the swimming pool is and maybe a tennis court and lots of lounge chairs. But it's the idea that Everybody has a spot. You have your room, uh, many rooms in his father's house, and yet there's plenty of space for us to gather as believers together. It's spacious and yet intimate. Um, so, you know, we don't know. Who knows what we're talking about here? But the idea is that home, home with rooms, is obviously a place of love, and, or it's meant to be a place of love, it's acceptance, it's where you find security, uh, it's where you go to be refreshed, hopefully. Uh, obviously, on this earth, some homes are places of fighting and contention, but they're meant to be that place where we can go and be loved, accepted, refreshed, renewed, comforted, and sent out uh, from there to face the world again for another day. C.S. Lewis says... Um, and it's there on your handout. God will look to every soul like its first love because he is its first love. Your place in heaven will seem to be made for you and you alone because you were made for it. Made for it stitch by stitch as a glove is made for a hand. Um, the Lord, he's, he said that he is going to prepare a place for us. The Lord Jesus himself is preparing that place for you and for me. And Graham Lotz, um, Billy Graham's daughter, I really like what she said. She says, our rooms in heaven will all be personalized. And she compared it to when uh, one of her grown children comes back home, maybe for the holidays or to celebrate her birthday or whatever. She says that she will go to their, their old bedroom and she will put in that bedroom, um, maybe some of the mementos uh, from their life that would be special to them, or photos, or uh, a bouquet of their favorite flowers. She will stock the fridge with uh, whatever was their favorite food, so that when they come home, they really feel like, come, this is home, and it was made special. Somebody took the pains to make me feel especially welcome and uh, feeling good about being here. And, and that's, that's a great picture, I think, uh, of heaven and of what Jesus is preparing for us. Maybe we'll be surprised and even have uh, <laughs> the walls painted in our favorite color. Who knows? Um, we don't know, uh, and that's the thing. But again, we're having, we'll have bodies, we'll have some place that will be ours. Uh, he says, if it were not so, if there weren't many rooms there, I would have told you. And he says, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. And that, to me, is one of the best promises of the whole Bible, with me, with Jesus Christ. Um, what about the passing of time on the new earth? 
Uh, well, under the curse that we're living under, uh, time is most of the time an enemy to us. Um, sometimes we try to race the clock, uh, to beat the clock. Um, time runs out on us when uh, we haven't finished what we wanted to do and the day comes to an end or we miss a deadline. Um, there's times when we just feel always rushed. Or you have the other extreme where time drags by. We find ourselves bored to death or we get antsy. When somebody says, oh, he has too much time on his hands. That is not a good thing. That's not meant as a compliment. That is, uh, that's not good. Um, our years here are limited, and we feel like there's so much to do and so little time. Uh, some people have their bucket lists that they're trying to accomplish before they leave this earth. Uh, so time is, is um, not exactly our friend. Um, Eternity is different. God inhabits eternity. Uh, Saint Peter, or <laughs> Second Peter says uh, that a thousand years to God is like a day, and a day is like a thousand years. It, he's just beyond time. God is eternal, and um, time is something we live with. Uh, Alcorn says in his book, God, quote, God knows and can access past and future as readily as the present. We can remember the past and anticipate the future, but we can only live in the present. Time is our environment. And because that's so, it's just hard for us to even imagine what is eternity. Um, the thing is, it's... In heaven, we, will, we are not going to become gods. I think Mormons say that, but <laughs> there is nothing in Scripture that says we will be gods. We are not even going to sprout wings and become angels. We will always be human because that's what God created us to be. And in that sense, we will be finite uh, to some degree. Um, but in reference to time in heaven, in Revelation 7... It does talk about the saints serving God day and night. Uh, chapter 8, verse 1 says, there's silence in heaven for 30 minutes. And chapter 22, of course, mentions the, the trees that are going to bear fruit each month, 12 months of a year. So obviously there is some sense of time. Uh, chronos time, and those are two Greek words, chronos, from where we get chronology, that's the kind of time we know. It's what the clock tells us. It measures it, hours, days, years, weeks, centuries. Kairos time is significant time. It's timeless moments. Uh, if you think about a time in your life where you might have said, time just stood still. Uh, and it could have been when you saw the ocean for the first time or the Grand Canyon or maybe when you held your baby or your grandchild in your arms for the first time and it was like everything was right in that moment. You know, you weren't thinking of the past, you didn't have regrets, you weren't thinking of your to-do list. Um, and in those times, we kind of touch, just for a moment, eternity. Um, it's the fullness of time. That's what eternity means. Uh, um, it's all of our time. It's sort of encompassed uh, by reality. So don't ever think of, wow, eternity just means unending time. Because that can have very negative connotations. Does anybody want to just live forever and ever, day after day, week after week, if that's what that means. Um, that's why even, you know, to think of life here on earth, would you really want to live here for another thousand years uh, the way life is? No, I don't think. Um, but it isn't just that unending time and what on earth are we going to do with it and how will we spend all that time? No, it's a fullness of time that encompasses um, just so much more than we can imagine now. But if you can think of those few times in your life when time stood still and you were so fully present in that moment, that's, that's uh, a taste of eternity. 
Um, our resurrected bodies, uh, at the resurrection day, when the dead are raised, uh, the physical body is reunited with the spirit or soul or both uh, without any imperfections or weakness or infirmity. We're transformed. And uh, 1 Corinthians 15 talks about that. It was um, our bodies were buried in the grave in, in dishonor, but they will be raised in glory. Uh, a brand new uh, body, and that's in the Apostles' Creed. We say, "I believe in the resurrection of the body," and that was a, a brand new thing as far as like the people who were Greeks. They, you know, the body is evil. You want to be done with it so that just your spirit or soul can be free, and that is not Judaism or Christianity. God created the body. Obviously, it's going to be a different body. It's a spiritual body, and yet has a physical part of it. Um, Somebody um, wrote the question down here, um, waiting about our new bodies. Uh, what happens to those who are cremated? Well, you know, obviously God can raise up, even from the ashes, uh, certainly our new body, because it isn't identical to, it's a new body, and yet it is still us, and people will recognize us. And, uh, I mean, you just... If, you know, if Jesus delays for another 500 years, we're all going to be pretty much dust anyway. And, you know, seriously, you think of martyrs who were burned at the stake or all those people in Lahaina who now they're sorting through ashes to try to figure out DNA and who they even were. Well, you know, that's not going to be a problem for God. And uh, he will raise up those who are cremated or those who have uh, just turned into dust over the centuries. Um, the Bible says uh, in 1 John 3, we know that when Jesus appears, we shall be like him. And Philippians chapter 3, verse 2 says um, that Jesus will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body, like him. So, what is Jesus' body like? Well, think about, think about Easter Sunday and uh, what we know about that. Because obviously Jesus already has been resurrected with a, his new body. Um, uh, Paul says that he is the firstborn uh, in the sense that the first to be resurrected. Uh, well, he appeared fully human. He certainly appeared fully human. He was not a ghost. He was not sort of supernatural in any sort of way. Uh, he wasn't eerie. He uh, wasn't glowing. There was no aura around him. Uh, Mary Magdalene, that Easter morning, even mistook him for the gardener working there uh, in the garden where the tomb was. The disciples on the Emmaus Road thought he was just another traveler. So he appeared, obviously, very, very human. Uh, Easter evening, when he appeared to the disciples, he and they were scared because they thought he must be a ghost. I mean, they saw him die. Um, he asked for a piece of fish, and he ate it in their presence so that they would be sure that, oh, yes, he's real. He is alive. We are not just seeing some sort of a, a vision here. Um, in uh, John chapter 21, the very last chapter of John, Jesus is standing on the shore, and they don't realize that it's Jesus at first. And then when they bring their boat ashore, they find that Jesus has a fire going and has even cooked breakfast for them and joins them in that meal. So we're talking about a fully human person. He held out his hands to... Uh, Thomas and invited him to take hold of them. So the kind of body we have will definitely be very physical. And yet Jesus uh, was different. He suddenly appeared in a room without needing to use the door. Uh, so that certainly was different. Um, he wasn't recognized at first, so there may be, of course, they weren't expecting to see him, so that figures into it. Um, so we don't know. Um, 
the empty tomb, the fact that the tomb was empty, says that uh, the resurrected body is not totally new. It was still Jesus' body. He had the scars in his hands. Uh, otherwise, the tomb would have not been empty if his body was still there. So he did, did have a physical presence, and so will we. Um, eternal life is much more than just, oh, my soul lives on. No, we will live on with that kind of spiritual body. Um, First Corinthians uh, explains it and doesn't explain it all at the same time because what how can you explain it but uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 35 someone will ask how are the dead raised what kind of body will they come how foolish what you sow does not come to life unless it dies when you sow you do not plant the body that will be but just a seed or perhaps of wheat or something else but God gives it a body as he has determined and to each kind of seed he gives its own body not all flesh is the same people have one kind of flesh animals have another birds another fish another um, there are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind, the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. Um, then he, verse 42, so it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown perishable, it is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Um, and then he goes on. Um, so we don't know. It'll be different, and yet, in a sense, it's the same DNA. Um, it's a spiritual body, not because it's like, wow, I can see through you. It's not that kind of spirit, but because we are empowered, made alive by the Spirit of God. Uh, but it is physical. Angels, angels are a whole different thing because they are spirit beings. Spirit beings that occasionally can take on bodies the way that we put on clothes and take them off. Uh, so angels are different, but we still will uh, have physical presence. Um, our bodies will reflect who we really are. Um, our faces now with our different expressions can uh, reflect something about ourselves and there will be a harmony of mind and body. Uh, at present, um, <laughs> if you're like me, you find that your body is not always cooperative. <laughs> um, it doesn't always do what we want. Um, I was very upset when my stupid knee gave out on me in the meniscus tore. Um, sometimes I, I am starving to death or I feel like I am and I know I've already eaten and don't need anything else. Uh, we sometimes want so desperately to fall asleep and yet insomnia keeps us awake and we think, why can't my body fall asleep when it is so tired? So, you know, there's this disconnect between who we really are, the spirit and soul of me, and this body that won't do what I want it to do. Uh, um, when I was growing up, I was never athletic, and it would have been so nice just once to get up in PE class and be able to get to first base instead of getting out every time I was up at base at home plate. You know, I mean, our bodies do not cooperate with us, um, and yet we'll still be human in heaven, but um, there will be that unity of body and soul and spirit. Um, we will be human. We will not be omnipresent. I would doubt that we will have the ability that Jesus has just simply to appear somewhere. Uh, but then you think about it, and the Lord can be in 10,000 different places at once doing 10,000 different things, and it's no big deal to him. Um, we are human. We will be at one place at one time. So, what does all this mean for us? Well, we will have a physical body, physical presence. We will keep our identities. Hinduism says, no, you just blend into the beingness of the universe, but um, we will keep our identities. 
um, Jesus said that heaven rejoices over one sinner who comes to him. And so each one of us is treasured by God. We will have our identities. Uh, probably we will eat, and I hope there's plenty of chocolate. <laughs> Um, there has to be, right? <laughs> uh, we will eat because uh, Jesus talked in Luke 22, verse 29 and following, that uh, about eating and drinking in the kingdom of heaven. He said that he would no, drink no more wine until he drank it anew when the kingdom of God came. Revelation 19 talks about the wedding supper of the Lamb. Um, so, you know, there are pictures of... Um, of eating in heaven and so you know who knows i mean you have trees with fruit why wouldn't be we eat that fruit i mean it would be kind of sad just to look at it and think hmm <laughs> i wonder how that would taste if i could eat <laughs> no you know there's there seems to be that possibility that we will eat in heaven um you know, it evidently all our senses will be still with us. Uh, and if we are to believe the near-death experiences, they will simply be heightened senses. Jesus cooked, he ate, he must have smelled the food as it was cooking. He obviously could see and hear um, and touch. Uh, so, you know, so much of it will be what we already know. Um, on emotions, obviously, yes, we will have emotions, love and joy, certainly. Uh, we'll be singing God's praises. That always is an emotional thing. But on the other hand, uh, our emotions will no longer control us. Um, we won't be controlled, our emotions, by our hormones or by our heredity or by circumstances. We won't let the demands of other people make such a difference in our lives. Uh, the emotions will be pure and good and fully to be experienced. Uh, we already talked a little bit about ethnicity. Um, and language, uh, we assume that uh, the whole Tower of Babel thing, when all the languages were confused, will be also redone, and that we will be able to have a shared language and um, understand each other. Age, <laughs> what age will we appear in heaven? Uh, you know, who knows? You know, there is no chronological time, only that Kairos time. Uh, the people with near-death experiences say the people they saw were ageless, and yet they talk about seeing children. Um, Jonathan Edwards, the Puritan preacher, said, we will all have eternal youth. Peter Lombard, who was a theologian of the 12th century, <laughs> said, all in heaven will seem to be 30 years old. <laughs> And I don't know if he chose that because that's about how old Jesus was when he was on earth in ministry. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, following that, well, he actually lived before Lombard, but he said everybody's going to appear to be, I think he, I'm, I don't know when Aquinas lived, but anyway, he said everybody in heaven will be about 33. And of course, again, Jesus was that age. Uh, gender. Well, Jesus was still male. We can assume that we will not be genderless. There will be no marriage in heaven. Jesus did say that. But, of course, if we're going to be who we are, who we are is who we are as male and female as well. So, um, who knows? But anyway, sleep and their opinions differ. Uh, some say that, well, sleep wasn't part of the curse. It's part of being human, so we should be sleeping in heaven sometimes. Uh, others say, well, there's no night there, so I don't know. You know, who knows? We'll just be surprised. Um, will we have free will? And uh, that's a bigger issue. And the thing is, uh, God valued free will so much that he allowed us even to fall into sin that cost his son his life. So it's hard to think that in eternity God would value free will any less than he does now. Um, you know, he would not be pleased with our offering worship simply because we had no choice. It was all we were able to do. He didn't create us to be robots. 
So there in the fill in the blank part, um, sin will have absolutely no appeal. Sin will have absolutely no appeal. The flesh will no longer trouble us and we will no longer be the center of our little universes. So you see, we're going to be so different that the thought of sinning, of rebelling against God, would just be horrendous. Um, it's just not something that's going to be attractive to us at all. Uh, Romans 6 verse 7 says a dead person is freed from sin. Hebrews 10 talks about our being perfected. 1 Corinthians 15 that we just read talks about our being incorruptible. Uh, there won't be any tempter anymore, no Satan to tempt us. Uh, we'll really be able to see sin for what it is. It will just be unthinkable to us. We'll see it in all of its ugliness. We won't believe its lies. Um, we'll remember what it cost Jesus to free us from sin. You know, if you think of the worst horrible thing um, in your own mind, you know, and maybe that would be abusing a child or something. And you, and you just know, you just know you would never, ever do that. It's just so horrific. It's just so horrible. Well, that's the way we will see all sin, pride, greed, whatever, uh, when we are in heaven. And so while we'll have that free will, it will not be something that will take us off track. And we had better stop there, and uh, we'll take up uh, next week with our relationships, and um, we will uh, finish up next week. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your promise of uh, home with many, many rooms and a place where Jesus will be with us always, and we will enjoy one another's company. We thank you for the insights you have given us into that life that is so beyond our comprehension. And, and uh, Lord, just give us the patience to live with uh, all those things that we do not yet know about eternity and life with you. But we do know, Lord, that uh, it certainly will be awesome and uh, more wonderful than we can imagine. So we thank you. We thank you, Jesus, for giving your life that we might know eternal life. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> we'll see you next week.